crowd to hear this, and to uh, I'd like to ask everyone to give a warm round of applause for everyone else that spoke tonight. Uh, okay, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, the name of the talk is psychology, personal development, and psychedelics. And I'm not going to break any boundaries here. In fact, a lot of this has already been talked about tonight, which was really uh, synchronized very well. And um, what I'm presenting are the ideas that are presented in this book called Psychedelic Healing by Neil Goldsmith. Uh, Neil Goldsmith, actually, I think my glasses are distracting me. I'll just be blind instead. So Neil Goldsmith is a psychologist who has restructured a paradigm of psychology, which he calls psychology which brings into consideration the idea of the psyche back into this sort of process of study of the mind. Um, I've got a quote I'm going to read here um, where he describes it. And I'm going to lose all my markings too. So, the word psychology comes from the Greek psyche, meaning soul, spirit, mind, life, and breath. Combined with the Greek logos, here used as statement, expression, and discourse, more often thought of today as uh, in the form of ology, or th as the study of. So he's saying that psychology is supposed to be the study of the soul, or the mind. So, another key facets of psychology is the idea of psycho-spiritual maturation, the true self, neurosis, interpersonal development, and the uh, development of personality, and the ego. And I'm gonna try to discuss a lot of that, cover it all today. So the true self is something that he presents as the psyche, the ground of your being. It is the part of you that exists before any other conditioning is placed onto you. When you're born as a child, you are naturally expressing this core self. Now, when I say child, I mean infant, like pre-operational, all you do is just be baby, right? <laughs> In this situation, you're expressing your core self out into this new world, and because as a baby, the only things that exist for you are your parents, these are your key, uh, the things that perpetuate your survival, you're presenting it out to them, and you're making a determination on how you're gonna to continue to survive in this world based on how your parents respond to that expression of your true or core self. Now, you determine how, uh, how effective what you have, uh, you're presenting from your core self is by <clears throat> determining how much love you get from your parents based on this expression. Because love for an infant is like the key focus of survival. Love means you're being given food, you're given shelter. So love is the key focus of an infant and how to best get this love. So say, we'll develop a, like an example here, okay? So as a baby, you are hungry, right? So you express this hunger by crying. And if you have good, conscious, mature, you know, psycho-spiritually mature parents, they hear you crying and they say, oh baby, you're hungry, I understand, that's okay, here's some food, you know? Or you're, you're crampy or something, and so you like, mm, or something, and, and you're expressing your core self, like you're just responding, this is honestly who you are. And your parents cultivate that expression of your true self by saying, it's okay, I love you, let's, let's take care of you, let's do something. So this becomes a bit interesting when the expression of your core self is to be creative, right? So you decide to draw a beautiful picture for mommy. However, you did it with mommy's lipstick and you did it on a wall. <laughs> so this is an expression of your core self. Now, if you have like mature, conscious, psycho-spiritually you know, developed parents, then you get the mom that says, oh, sweetie, that's a beautiful picture, but next time, use these pencils on this paper, you know? Most of us don't have that. I don't think any of us have ever had that. <laughs> so you get, you get one of two responses, right? And these, one of these two responses is, uh, is sort of <clears throat> what will lead you to deviate from that expression of your core self. And those two responses are a hot response, 
oh my god, why are you doing this? Don't draw on the wall, blah, blah, blah. You know, like, you get angry, or you get a cool response. And that cool response will just be like, don't do that. Love is shut off. So what does baby learn? Baby learns, if I make this expression of my core self, then I'm not gonna get the love that I need to survive. So in mind of baby, which is not like mind of us who can contemplate other avenues to consider, you know, what's gonna do what and where and how we could sort something out, we just know we can't get love this way, don't act that way. So you deviate from that expression of the core self and then what happens is you develop a personality trait. As you go throughout life, you develop, or well, sorry, as you go through the development of your childhood, you develop all sorts of personality traits. Each personality trait being a contorted expression of your core self. Eventually getting to a point where you're older, what you have is a dishonest expression of who you are because you're your personality, not your true self. And this dishonest expression of who you are creates an inaccurate view of your reality because instead of interacting with the world exactly how it is, you're interacting with the world as if it is an expression of this potential stealing of love or aggression that's going to come from you being honestly who you are and you develop all sorts of uh, tendencies to suppress your true self. So my notes. Yeah, so when you do this, you're creating like a defensive shell, like your personality trait is a defensive shell and that defensive shell is like your ego. Right now, he doesn't present the ego as a bad thing or a good thing. It's a very, it's a, in a highly functioning individual, it is a very successful method by which you can interact with others and you know, you can utilize the ego to progress your own life and so on and so forth. In less progressive situations, it becomes this like tape recording of expressed, um, you know, pathologies or something, maybe not pathologies, thinking of different words. It's essentially like, it's an expression of these, this, this defense mechanism, this like, I need my love, you know, I think you know what I mean when I say like, egoic tendencies that aren't really constructive to your environment or your life. So, why do our parents act this way? Well, our parents act this way because they were treated that way. And so what they implanted into us when they cause us to develop these personality traits are actually results of how their parents treated them or their situation. So, for example, um, your mother doesn't really like the idea of cleaning off the walls. In fact, she has some sort of deep-seated psychological issue with her parents freaking out at her for doing something. So when you draw on the wall, she freaks out at you in the same way she was freaked out at, perpetuating this sort of like lineage of, uh, of personality traits or of these destructive sort of self-limiting um, things that prevent you from expressing your core self. One of the things that lead up to um, when you get a bit older with these personality deviations do is they develop levels of neurosis. Now, neurosis to Neil Goldsmith is not a bad thing. Um, it is what he calls a, like a marking point to psycho-spiritual maturation. So I'll just talk about that really quickly. Psycho-spiritual maturation is the process by which we become more in line with our core self. We become more in line with psychologically functioning from the deepest ground of our being, which is whatever we are honestly at our core. And neurosis, for example, like always having a tendency to get stuck and not make a decision on something, or be self-limiting or self-appreciating, um, you know, or get angry about this specific thing, even though it's completely trivial, are actually marking points for um, psycho-spiritual immaturity, and they're a very good thing as long as you don't pathologize it. Oftentimes, in current or contemporary psychology, neurosis is pathologized. You were told it's bad, it's wrong, it's a disease, and so you dislike that aspect of yourself, thus strengthening that aspect within yourself by feeding it negative energy. He sees neurosis as a good thing because when you realize you're being neurotic about something, you've given yourself the opportunity to make that next step in your own psycho-spiritual growth and you gain this ability of like, yeah, I did it, I'm growing. You earn wisdom, you get elated about your own personal progress. But we won't grow out of neurosis unless we 
are in a situation where we can be left to cultivate it, or sorry, to cultivate our core self. We are naturally and biologically programmed to mature, like everything in life just will just mature, it'll just grow, unless there is something stopping it or blocking it. Like if we're in an environment where every time we express our core selves, we're told no, you can't do that, we block that growth. Or if every time, for example, this one tendency comes up, like you get angry about something, or you get, um, you get really selfish when somebody asks about this certain thing, and then you get angry at yourself for being this selfishness, you've prevented yourself from growing beyond it. When we as people in environments, or even as people within ourselves, can learn to recognize those neurotic tendencies and say, it's okay, I'm growing, and create a space of love and acceptance and support, we will just naturally grow out of it. <clears throat> so, when we get a little bit, when we get older and we have this like, this duality between our core self and our, our personality, we need to be addressing this. We've got this personality and the things that come with it are you know, the response to issues we have with our parent, right? What we will do when we have these issues with our parent, because we need to sort out this relationship problem that we have that now only exists within us, within us, is we will project it onto another person, or we'll project it onto the world instead of dealing with it within ourselves. A great example of this is when you're with a partner, like uh, you know, your, your deep, your intimate partner. Say there's an aspect of you growing up that was beaten out of you, for example, like, uh, your father was really aggressive with you and said you're weak, you're weak, you're weak, and you got hit for being weak, and so you hate this aspect inside of yourself that is weak. So in order to address this aspect that you don't like about yourself, you inflate a tough guy attitude and project the weakness onto your partner so you can berate and you know, give shit to that weak aspect of yourself by making your partner that weak aspect of yourself instead of dealing with it inside of you. And we do this on so many different levels. With our intimate partner, we often find ourselves in a situation where we're holding against them an inaccurate view of who they really are because what we're seeing is our destructive relationship with our opposite sex parent. And when we can learn to recognize that, we can go into um, a stage of relationship wherein we can use our relationship as constructive tools to heal things within ourselves specifically our relationship with our parents, who are the reason we're screwed up at this point because they weren't enlightened Buddhas when they were raising us as babies. <laughs> to Neil Goldsmith, he describes three different levels of a relationship, okay? The first level is infatuation. They do no wrong. They are amazing, everything is beautiful, it's like the honeymoon. And then the next stage is the power struggle. You know, and that's when you get a lot of conflict. And oftentimes, each partner will say, you know, 70%, 80% of the problem is them, right? And then the other person, no, 80% of the problem is them, when in reality, it's like a 50-50 situation. The third, the third aspect is conscious relationship. You've gotten to a point where you recognize that collectively with each other, you're no longer in this power struggle of who owns what and who's creating more conflict and so on and so forth, instead of stimulating conflict in an effort to have some sort of energetic pull between you, you cultivate a loving connection where each person helps you grow through your own psychological issues that exist only within you, um, so that you can both grow collectively. Because, I mean, where is that 24-year-old woman that screwed you up, right? She's not in the 64, like the 60-year-old mature woman that you have now. That mother that screwed you up, the only place she exists is inside of you, and unless you're conscious of that, she'll exist outside of you, projected onto your partner, or projected onto the world. As Tracy said earlier, we take the psychological problems that are within us, that we don't want to deal with in ourselves because they're too challenging, and we project them onto the world around us, and we create blame, and we create anger, we create conflict or self-inflating self sympathy in order to avoid dealing with the fact that that is a reality of who we are within, not necessarily a completely external thing. So, 
I'm not sure how much time I have. I think I've been going pretty quickly. I had some matcha earlier. It was really good. <laughs> um, so now that we've gone through psychology and personal development, psychedelics, what role do they play? Now, this book, all right, it's called Psychedelic Healing, The Promise of Entheogens for Psychotherapy and Spiritual Development. And though it's like a key tentative to like the book, he doesn't really talk about it very much. Um, he mostly just explains this concept of psychology. <clears throat> for him, the role psychedelics play in somebody's personal development is that when you take a psychedelic, regardless of what it might be, um, though we can maybe get into some questions about that afterwards, about which is more constructive and less constructive depending on environment and so on and so forth, what you've done is you've taken some sort of chemical tool to expose to your conscious mind an expression of your core self. The, the operations that's happening on your deep subconscious level come into your conscious observation and interaction and an expression of whatever you know the experiential characteristics are of that psychedelic. And it allows you to have a better understanding of your core self by dissolving away the expressions of your personality when it brings up you know, and illuminates this ground of your being into your experience. And then, from that experience, you can take with you an identification that you have created through having direct experience of a core self that has been deeply embedded under layers and layers of personality, ego, and, you know, the slow unfolding of neurotic tendencies into psycho-spiritual growth. Almost in a way that because your core self is more in line with naturally who you want to be in comparison to your personality or your somewhat destructive egoic tendencies, you have a, ten you have a, a natural form to like resonate toward it, towards it, like sympathetic resonance. You become a little bit closer to your core self because you've been exposed to it. Utilized appropriately within psychotherapy by a trained professional, for example, if we ever hopefully get to that point where we can have trained professionals doing this. Um, or even, you know, in a situation where you have someone who you're able to safely experiment with constructively and you're both in the same space to help each other grow. Um, so, yes, yeah, so like I said, I don't know how much time I have. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to read in here just like a good rundown of everything that psychology is. As several points, just in case I didn't cover something. It says, psychology is about the direct experience of the foundation of our true self. I, all, I want to emphasize that in psychology, we are not talking about the personality, but the true original self, the self we were born as before our parents had at us. Our true original self lies under our personality and our transpersonal ground of our being at our core. As newborns, we are all perfect. Of course, we have individual differences of birth, like a wide-ranging form of trees in the forest, yet we're all perfect in our essence. Safety and love is the key central issue of infancy. Lack thereof results in defensive hijacking of the ego function to create a personality as acquired strategy to attain love. Personality is a strategy devised by an earlier, immature version of our adult self. Neurosis is the natural, stepwise unfolding of human maturation. It is not pathology, but spiritual immaturity. Empathy and acceptance, love, for our parents and ourselves enable us to relax and release the knot in our psyche to disidentify with the defensive personality and re-identify with the original core self, to finally complete our childhood. And just to elaborate on that, part of the process you go through when you start to heal the relationship you have within yourself with the parent that screwed you up when you were a child is to accept that they are imperfect beings as well. And I'm sure as we've all grown up, we've gotten to that point where we're like, this thing that we really didn't like about our parents, we recognize Man, you know, if I was 25 years old, raising two children as a single mother, I probably would have freaked out at this too, and maybe I shouldn't blame them for it. Um, <clears throat> the desire for change is a reflection of the problem. 
not of the solution. So working on yourself or your relationships doesn't work. Rather, the only thing to do is simply to be, and simply being is not the result of an active pursuit, but rather the natural result of releasing the self from the encumbrance of distraction of immature personality strategy. So what he's saying here, again, I didn't touch on this, is that <clears throat> when you realize that there's something wrong, that's, that's not a problem that you work on, right? Um, you, it's something that you just recognize as a step in your, in your situation. So like I have this tendency to get upset. I don't try to work on why I get upset. I don't try to like go really deep into why I get upset in order to understand it, right? All I'm gonna do is perpetuate it, obsess over it, and you know, just like, like more deeply pronounce it in my life. But what instead I should, should or could do is to just sit back and hold a space of love and growth and just allow myself to be naturally who I am, self like developing self-awareness and just choosing new as it comes up in my natural maturation. Transformative development, developmental change is possible. through a stepwise dualistic dance, a combination of transcendent and cathartic therapeutic approaches. So he's talking about the idea of um, actually like, like transformative change, like what does that really mean? You know, if I, if I like stub my toe and I go, oh wow, I'm totally gonna pay attention when I'm walking now in, in this part of my house. That's not a transformative change. Transformative change like unlocks a whole new you. And if any of you guys have taken psychedelics, you recognize in the right situation that is a transformative experience. He says that transformative experience can happen, and they happen in two ways, oftentimes when they combine. The two ways are a transcendent experience, which allows you to step outside of all your conditioning, all your issues, and look with love. You know, like he describes his, his first LSD trip in over 20 years when he's a 40 year old and trying it again from you know, a multiple PhD psychology degree, and he's going down in his mind and he sees his roots. You know, he's like, oh, these are my psychological roots. I'll just go try to shift them around. And they like recoil in fear. And he goes down a little bit deeper and deeper and he goes to this space of just absolute love. And he just realizes that he's perfect. Everything about his life is perfect. He's perfectly on track. Everything is working out. He doesn't have to get upset at himself. This is the process and he's gonna get there in the end. So on his way up from this transcendent experiences, he sees his roots, and instead of trying to pick at them and work on them like we talked before, he just loves them and says, you're so beautiful, and they unfold in front of him. Right. And the other way is cathartic. Um, we'll go back to like mommy issues. Is something coming up here? I don't know. Um, so, <laughs> so, you know, like this one thing, your mom did something to you a long time ago that is trivial now, at this point, it's trivial. Like you look back as an adult, like it's trivial. But at that time, as a child, it destroyed you. And a cathartic approach is also something that he says is stimulated by psychedelics. And if any of you have done magic mushrooms, for example, I find they are very powerful for giving this cathartic release, which is you go back to that moment where your mother did this trivial thing and you cry, man, you bawl, you feel it all. You let go everything that you've tensed up inside because like, you don't, like, I don't need to be upset at it. I shouldn't be upset at that anymore. I'm not sad anymore, it's trivial. But like, when you're in a cathartic release, you let it go, you're crying it all out, so that when it's out, when you're done with it, you go, wow, I've shed myself of this thing. And he says, together, between a transcendent and a cathartic um, experiences, you can push or more naturally develop towards transformative change. Psychedelic therapy can be a safe and extremely effective tool in facilitating transformative development change by enabling us to see ourselves with love and to safely engage in catharsis, which is the cathartic release. Stunted or skewered development can be gotten back on track, but psychedelics are not cognitive development or enlightenment in a pill. Psychedelics can trigger insight but behavior change takes time, and in this culture, such realignment is often harder to sustain than we acknowledge. This is important to consider, and a lot of people, because I am an avid sort of like, I mean, I would never recommend anybody to do anything illegal, because that's illegal here in Canada, but <laughs> if somebody comes and says, what is your personal opinion on this? My personal opinion is always, these things will not bless, like, 
they won't change you in a way where it's like they're the answer. You know, psychedelics are not the way. What they are is an opportunity to take a look at what you're doing. You know, like it gives you a better idea of how to understand your choices and who you are. Whether or not you implement that in your life is dependent on you and your choices to work with that afterwards. You know, and that also depends on the environment in which you take it, the community that you're in afterwards, and whether or not your community cultivates it, and generally the social paradigm of these substances, which at this point on the larger scale is not very pleasant, or very intelligent, or very truthful. But in the smaller community, I can guarantee you, if you haven't already discussed with somebody, um, somebody here will have something beautiful for you and can help you cultivate the lessons you learn from it. <clears throat> also, he talks about how policies right now, drug policy, for example, is like severely skewed and based on political stigma and the fear of like losing political power, um, a lot of which was developed um, from the Controlled Drug and Subs the Controlled Substance Act in 1970, which is implemented by the United States and then echoed throughout the world and the world's drug policy in an effort to suppress the use of illicit drugs like psychedelics because they were really afraid about how these psychedelics were making people not interested in buying shit, not interested, <laughs> not interested in participating in the Vietnam War, and essentially not really interested in, in keeping the machines running when the machines were not running for anything functional other than keeping the machines running. Uh, so he says, effective method exists for changing policies and bureaucracies, and we honor <clears throat> and we are honor bound to bravely apply them in the pursuit of science, truth, and freedom, um, which I agree. Not science is a dogmatic old boys club, but science is a method where we allow other people's sort of rigorous experiments, you know, experience, and so on and so forth, that presents a clearer, grander, more holistic view on what is real to be integrated over what was previously a structured ideology that we became familiar with as opposed to what was actually the truth. <clears throat> Thank you, just wait, hold on. <laughs> hold your applause, please. <laughs> My mouth is a bit dry and I need some algae drink. Okay, so, um, this is going to like finish up on the talk, but I am going to open it up to questions. Okay. Um, so does anyone have any questions about the book, any of the things that I said, or even psychedelics in general? Any references to Terrence McKenna? Uh, in this book? Yes. Um, I'm not sure if he does reference Terrence McKenna, but if anyone doesn't know, Terrence McKenna is a very important dude to look at. He brought a very intelligent idea of the significance of psychedelics, specifically dimethyltryptamine or DMT and psilocybin to a culture of kids who were experimenting with drugs but didn't understand it um, because there was no intellectual base because the government was like, whoa, whoa, whoa these things scare us. We can't even study them. <laughs> we can't even look at these things. Um, and he brought an intelligent presentation, a language to talk and share about these things. So Terrence McKenna do check him out. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. Does uh, psychedelics does it stimulate the pineal gland? Um, no, okay. Um, the association between the pineal gland and psychedelics is the idea presented by Rick Strassman with his experiments in the 90s on DMT. We presented the hypothesis that DMT could be produced in the pineal gland. DMT is an incredibly um, potent uh, psychedelic compound um, and that it could also be created endogenously like within our body and that it's developed within the pineal gland because the pineal gland also develops melatonin which is like one or two steps before developing DMT um, and those steps are also something that are facilitated by the pineal gland and he associated that to the a lot of eastern traditions of the third eye the pineal gland having a retina and the lens um, and also being directly located where the eastern or mystical traditions of the third eye being and that being something along the ideas of spiritual vision or spiritual like awareness uh, correlated those things together um, so that's the, like, the idea of psychedelics in the pineal gland I don't necessarily think that is the case 
Um, but I'm not a scientist, so I, I couldn't say for sure. I believe that what you're doing is processing the substances that you've taken into your body within your brain and not necessarily stimulating that from within, but jury's still out on that. Aaron? Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me answer your first question first um, before you go on to the second one, right? Um, developing a dependence. I really don't think that as you continue to take psychedelics, if you start to say, "Oh, like I need this to learn and grow," um, it's going to show you why that's not a good idea if it's not. So, um, taking things like cocaine or heroin or alcohol or nicotine or sugar, you know, those things develop, those are drugs that develop a dependence in a way where it's like you need more of it to feel the goodness that you were feeling, okay? With psychedelics, um, oftentimes if you've taken it in the wrong place or context or misusing it, you're going to um, definitely have an experience that does not make you want to take it again anytime soon. Uh, <laughs> though there is the ideological um, concern where people think it is the way I need to keep taking it like um, Richard Alpert or Baba Ramdas, who felt as if he could take LSD to get into the presence of God and then even had an ex This guy's really intelligent, by the way, Baba Ramdas, he's a wonderful speaker and a writer. Um, he developed an experiment where maybe if they took LSD for 30 days continuously, that they could stay in the presence of God and it still didn't work. Um, that, <laughs> that brought him to India and yoga, which apparently did work for him. Um, so like the dependence part, I wouldn't worry about too much. Um, that's actually frequently said to me as people say, well, you're cheating if you take drugs. You know, like, I'm not, I'm not mocking you there. I'm, I'm kind of mocking, but not you. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, some people would say it's the easy way out, but I don't know if you've ever tried to address, you know, personal concerns within yourself um, while on a psychedelic drug, but it certainly isn't easy. Um, though meditation is a different way towards, uh, towards a sense of finding centered, centeredness within yourself. Psychedelics are a way as well, though I think meditation and psychedelics work cohesively with each other very constructively. Everybody has a different way. Everybody is on a different path. What in psychedelics? Meditation and psychedelics. Mm. Okay. Um, so I don't necessarily think that it's, I don't think, I don't think it's cheating in any way. You just are exposed. You're like seeing another, for example, okay, so if I'm trying to get to a place I've never been before, I don't have a map, I have no idea how to get there. It'll probably take me a really long time. But if somebody drives me there once, shows it to me, and then brings me home, chances are I can work to get there a little bit easier. Psychedelics are that like friend giving you a lift to show it. Meditation and other things can be tools by which you then find your way back. So. Third, the third last thing, is there a, isn't there a concern, and I'm specifically thinking about ayahuasca, of actually creating a commodified point that it not only depletes um, the source of it in, say, the Amazon, um, but actually um, kind of is culturally insensitive too, in the sense that this white sense of consumerist culture has earth of control of a culture that indigenous people have over there. And also the fact that the ingredients in the soil is not, you know, are we not encouraging other people to grow up in other places? It's not going to have the same effect. Um, okay, that's, okay, cultural appropriation is something that we do have to be concerned about. Ayahuasca, I guess specifically, the use of ayahuasca, which is a, a shamanic uh, brew used in South America, which is a combination of a DMT complaining tank containing plant and a plant that contains something called beta carbolines which reduce uh, the metabolizing of DMT, which breaks down immediately in your gut um, in a way that gives you this long DMT experience and it's very sacred and it's very old. Um, the idea of destroying those traditions um, by taking it in all sorts of wild, wacky ways, that is definitely a problem. 
uh, not a problem, it could present itself as a problem, as it has been with the development of ayahuasca tourism and the development of people like just taking it completely outside of uh, the cultural context in, in wherever in the world. The idea of having to mass produce these things because it's a commodity now and having it shipped around the world and the detriment to the ecology of the area that cultivates it is also an issue. Um, and that whole white centric thing again is also an issue. But with the nature of these compounds, essentially, I really do believe that with time, they're gonna teach it to yourself. Like you're gonna, they're gonna teach to you why that isn't a good idea. Um, and though it is an issue, I don't think it's, it's an issue to keep in mind, not necessarily an issue to say, I shouldn't have this really profound spiritual experience because I might be culturally appropriating someone else somewhere else. You just have to be wary of, like don't take someone and say like, I'm a shaman now because I took ayahuasca because it's not right. Um, or I took mushrooms ten times, come see me, I will guide you. Um, okay, go for it. Um, I would just like to add on to the last two points there, starting from the third going to the second. Um, if heroin is legal tomorrow, how many people are going to go out and try it? If mushrooms, <laughs> so if mushrooms or acid are legal tomorrow, how many people here are going to go and do it randomly? A few. I don't think that we're going to see a large scale consumption uh, of psychedelics. Yeah, Portugal, uh, uh, Holland, great examples uh, to look at for broader society. Um, the second point about reaching spirituality, um, there, I don't believe that there is anything as a uh, fake spiritual experience. Whether you achieve it through meditation, psychedelics, or a near-death experience, you have changed your perspective and you have reached some form of spirituality. It is just, it, it's like a key that helps to unlock the first lock on the door. In the long run, the good idea, yes, is probably to practice on a regular basis to try to better yourself and bring your mind to a better point. But it, I don't think it should be frowned upon to use something that might be considered a cheat to let you experience the true spirituality and the true nature and connectedness of the universe. In fact, it's a very potent tool for a lot of people. Not everyone will do it, not everyone will need it, but for those who could use it and could benefit from it, it's, it should be used. Thank you. Um, I really overdone my time, I'm sorry. I'm gonna just take one more question from Olivia because I saw her hand up, and then we're gonna work. Uh, Um, I would start with reading um, the works or listening to the talks of people who have taken that step before you, like Terence McKenna, like Baba Ramdas, uh, like Neil Goldsmith, James Spademan. Um, another good example, uh, another good source is maps.org, which is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. You can get a lot of information there, a lot of literature. But I'd say just experiment a little bit with literature before you start experimenting with the drugs. And um, my, my biggest suggestion is to pick an intention as to why you're using it before you use it. Find a compound, like think of your intention, find a compound that matches what you're attempting to achieve, and then try it that way in a constructive, safe, closed situation with someone that you care about, supportive, maybe as a sitter at first, maybe on your own in the future. Um, and also I would say that if you can't think of at least one reason why you're taking something, a psychedelic or a drug, with like one intention, then you shouldn't be taking it at all. So that's something to be considered. Um, so thank you guys so much for listening.